Ladies and gentlemen of the wonderful internet realm, welcome back for another weekly episode of Coffee and Games or Power Up. I'm not sure what to call this audio blog series yet. Maybe you guys could help me out and vote on a on a title for the series. I still to this day have not figured out what to call this audio blog series. Should we call it Coffee and Games or Power Up? Let me know in, in a comment in form of a comment what you would prefer. Uh, but I hope you all have a big bucket of caffeine by your side. I sure do. We're here back at it again to discuss and dissect the latest uh, controversies and news in the games industry. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about. We have uh, IGN on strike for sexual harassment. Uh, the latest um, awful shenanigan with Star Wars Battlefront 2 involving EA, the developing company. We have the voice actor strike to talk about. The Video Game Awards show, which is coming up next month in, in early December. BlizzCon 2017, which is the latest gaming event, major gaming, gaming event to happen recently. And uh, we also are going to quickly touch on Stardew Valley, uh, which is going to get some updates pretty damn soon. But let's first talk about IGN, one of the biggest video game journalism outlets on the internet uh, the guys, the employees at IGN were on strike for a few days uh, in support of a former employee who was sexually harassed by um, a reviewer of the company who just recently was let go. So, uh, Katie Plague, who now works for GameStop, or GameSpot? GameSpot. GameStop is... The store, not the not the website. I keep getting both of them confused every damn time. But Katie Plague, who used to be a reviewer for IGN, who is now working for GameSpot, recently um, tweeted out a massive thread on Twitter about her awful uh, awful uh, sexual harassment story involving uh, the IGN editor Vince Ingenito, who uh, allegedly harassed her for. Not just on not just on one occasion, but for many many months, uh, along with another female employee who still is to this day working for IGN. Uh, he made a lot of a lot of unwarranted compliments about guys not liking skinny girls, calling her perfect, and touching her hand when she didn't feel comfortable. There, there is a lot to it. If you want to look at the at the tweet. Uh, you can go to her Twitter handle on Twitter, at Inky Dejiko, E-I-K-Y-D-O-J-I-K-K-O. And uh, it's it's the, the one tweet with 3,000 retweets. You'll see it. It's got the hashtag MeToo. Uh, but I read the, the entire thing, and it seemed pretty believable. I'll, I'll, I'll be completely honest and say that uh, her full story is legitimate. It feels legitimate, and um, a lot of the times when people are still working for a company where they f have had sexual harassment, where they're s when they're still working for that company, they're very unlikely to come forward when they're still on a contract, right? They don't want to lose their job. They're very not very not very few people are brave enough and courageous to take the dive and to risk their career as an up and coming uh, uh, video game industry personality uh they, they're they're very reluctant on coming forward when it comes to these kind of things when they're still working under that that company where they've they've had a terrible experience right so they don't want to lose their job but when they're moving on and they're switching sides then usually you'll see them being a lot more comfortable about being open on public public platforms like twitter or facebook even um uh, so I'm not very surprised, and I I can I can believe this story, um, and it's it's unfortunate that this happened. Appar apparently, it's been happening to to her for an extended amount of time when she worked for IGN, and um, it also happened to another female employee at the same time, who is still to this day working for the company who has not uh, come forward yet. But uh, in response. To the story, Alana Pierce, who is the current host of The Daily Fix, the 
regular news program by IGN. She's decided to step away and to not record the latest Daily Fix uh, in support of Katie Plague's story. So she's not been working on her series at IGN, Alana Pierce, and a few other employees as well. So a lot of the, the staff at IGN have pulled back in on strike and uh, have been have waited for an apology, an official apology from IGN, uh, which, by the way, finally put it up on their website. Um, Human Resources has decided to uh, come forward on the official website with a an official apology. Yes, they have. Uh, they have said that they're 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 feeling distraught about the whole situation, and that they're going to improve their Human Resources department. Um, I think, uh, I think the story is pretty disgusting, you know, it, it, but this is stuff that happens all the time in the workplace a lot. It doesn't matter if it's in the games industry, uh, but a lot of this happens in the workplace. A lot of females get harassed by their, um, by male counterparts who are either their peers or people in higher power and in, in higher hierarchy in in the for the in the company when it comes to working for a company a lot of female employees get sexual advances by their bosses um by people who are usually higher in status in the workforce which to me is no surprise and it's something that should be called out on but it's very hard to do so when if management is corrupted or disorganized it's it's something that still needs a lot of work a lot of Companies need to improve their manage management, and it's unfortunate that uh, management and companies uh, generally don't notice this, these things. They kind of they either notice it and put it under the table, or they don't put the effort in noticing these things, or they don't, or they believe that the female employees being a little bit over oversensitive or taking matters a little bit too seriously when in fact it's you know it's it's interrupting their work and when they're being constantly hounded or or stalked by an employee when they're clearly at work and they are not comfortable with that person making those sexual advances then then it becomes a serious problem so i think it's a prevalent issue in, in, in today's society i mean i mean this has been going on for centuries right women being harassed by by men it's not nothing new, but at the same time, I think we can, I think, I think we can proceed to a real change. And the more we're going to see women coming forward, I think the more likely we're going to see changes in companies and, and workforces and corporations when it comes to um, taking care of their employees and, and putting them on an equal playing field, right? Not undermining females and, you know, Keeping a good eye on every employee. And it doesn't matter, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. If you harass a fellow employee, if you get to the point where an employee is, is, is uncomfortable being, being around you and is feeling tempted to write a report about you and your behavior, then, you know, I think managers are supposed to notice these things. And maybe management is... is should take the initiative to approach their employees and say, hey, are you feeling okay? Do you want to talk about this for a while? And not just put everything under the rug, right? Pretend like nothing's happening and just work and just worry solely on revenue and, and the company's um, profitability and whatnot. I think uh, I think it's great that, that some of the IGN Employees decided to do that for a former employee, not just an employee who who was a worker for the company before, but someone that finally stepped stepped uh, stepped out of the dark and talked about her story, right? And it's been a while since she's worked for IGN, but I think it was very important for her to do that, and I, I'm I'm very uh, very happy that she did. You know, I don't really know that personality that well. At the end of the day, I'm not really fond of her work. But I think when IGN employees, when you're part of a big company that makes a lot of money on the internet, or, or any company that makes a, a shitload of revenue, when you have employees coming together in solidarity to support a former employee like that, I think it's, uh, 
something to be highly looked upon, and people should revere that kind of behavior, right? A lot of a lot of people nowadays are are either afraid of losing their job or they just pretend like nothing's happening or they just say, hey, uh, you know, it'll be all right. Just get over it. I think that that kind of behavior is not going to help uh, the affected person, the victim. And it's not even going to help people who are avoiding the topic because that just shows that they're a bad friend or a bad co-employee and you can easily lose a lot of respect for people if they behave like that. And this happens all the time. Unfortunately, a lot of people, the very few people are willing to have the balls to come forward and say, I will support my former, my former employee or my co-employee if they're having this problem. You know, let's not pretend like bad shit's not happening because I'm afraid of losing my job. No, I'm, I'm willing to risk my job and have a couple others risk their jobs together as as a solid group of of workers who really care about company integrity let's come forward together and support our our friend here who is feeling uncomfortable who's having pro- clearly having problems with management or whoever they're working with who is being inappropriate around them let's do it together and this is what we this is kind of the kind of work culture that we need to cultivate and i'm sorry if i'm kind of uh, going off on a, on a tangent here, it's this is becoming kind of a rant about p- principle and 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 how people should support each other when when in need when someone's in need of clearly in need of support and moral support and help. So, but I think this story was pretty cool, and I'm glad that IGN has actually uh, provided a, uh, like an official apology about it. Uh, it took him a little bit of time, admittedly, but they did it, and uh, you know it shows that there is still hope, right? Despite IGN being a cor- uh, like a massive company, right? You have workers within the company who are who are principled and who do care about the the well being of their employees, and they're not all willing to put it under the rug. So I'm I'm glad that this story was covered on the internet. But let's move on with so- something a little bit more interesting. Uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2, which recently just came out. Um, Why are we talking about Star Wars Battlefront 2, you wonder? Well, let's talk about their loot crate system, which is uh, the big topic centered, the the big uh, detail that makes Star Wars Battlefront 2 a controversial game currently. So if you guys aren't familiar with loot crates, and how microtransactions uh, are currently designed in video games. Let's uh, let's bring up a few examples, right? So in CS:GO, Rocket League, PUBG, or Overwatch, you can buy loot crates, which are boxes, digital boxes that include cosmetic items. Loot crates in those games exclusively have cosmetic items. The items involved in those loot crates do not affect the gameplay whatsoever. They are only uh, for aesthetic value, right? So if you want, let's say on Overwatch, you you play your favorite character and they offer you different skins for that character. Cosmetic skins that... Uh, make your character look different. If, if, if you want to make your character look different, you can you can get those skins for free. You can either play enough of the game to get that particular skin or work towards it. You can't pick the skin that you want, but you can buy, you can get loot crates in Overwatch every level. And leveling in Overwatch takes a considerable amount of time. Not that much, but if you play enough games, let's say three, four hours of gameplay, then you can level up and get a free loot crate. Or if you don't have a lot of time for video gaming, uh, you could just buy the loot crate for $199 or, or however much. I don't exactly remember what the price tag on Overwatch loot crates are, but they're fairly cheap, right? So if you don't have all that much time to play video games, you could buy the Overwatch loot crate and see if you can get the if, if you can get that cosmetic. Now, something that should be pointed out is 
loot crates provide randomized items, right? So loot crates don't provide you the the, the item that you re that you want. It's not guaranteed to give you the, to give you the cosmetic that you so desperately want, right? It's still randomized at the end of the day, but if you think about it, if you if you have a lot of disposable income, you are more likely to get that particular skin in, a, in, in fairly less amount of time. You can get it way more quickly than someone that plays the game every day, four, five, six hours a day, right? The, the ratio of, of getting that skin when, when not choosing to pay money to buy a loot crate, it takes a lot. What I'm saying is it takes a lot more effort to get a, a skin for free than it is to get it with uh, microtransactions. Now, back to Star Wars Battlefront 2. So, in Star Wars Battlefront 2, uh, you can get star cards. Star cards are items that actually affect affect gameplay, and they're not they're not just my, uh, what is it? Cosmetics, right? Star cards are power ups. Let's say that affect you, the character that you play, and star cards are obtainable through in game credits. In-game credits are the, the currency that you collect by playing the game. Or, conversely, you can buy crystals. Crystals is uh, the currency that is purchased with real-life money. So you can either get star cards with in-game credits or crystals. Star cards uh, are obtainable through crates. Loot crates, quote-unquote, which you can buy with in-game credits or the uh, real money currency crystals. Uh, the crates are the items that provide random star cards. And again, the, the crates in Star Wars provide randomized star cards. So you're not for sure going to get the star card that you might want. So it would take a couple purchases to get to the, the star card that you would want to get. Now, here's the interesting part of those star card traits. Uh, crates, sorry. Some star cards are only obtainable through paid loot crates. So that means, what that means is, if you have money to spend on the game, then if you, if you, if you have the money to spend on Star Wars Battlefront 2 even further, after the initial purchase of the game, then you can get star cards that are only unique through paid loot crates, which is pretty messed up if you think about it. Now, on top of that, uh, people are reportedly claiming that it takes around 40 hours of gameplay to unlock special uh, characters like Luke Skywalker if you decide to not buy credits. If you decide to not buy crystals, sorry. So... And also, additionally, uh, the game has a credit limit on certain game modes. So, like, for example, if you play arcade mode in Star Wars Battlefront 2, you can only get a f uh, so much credit until you get timed out. Uh, f until you get timed out, and you have to, then you have to wait three more hours to get more credits. So that is really really messed up when you think about all of those details it seems like ea is really um i don't think ea understands what consumers want they think in dollar bills and uh they have completely disregarded the greatness of the microtransaction system and how it works so well because if you look at every other game that has microtransactions. Let's say League of Legends. League of Legends is not only successful successful for its esports scene, but makes a shit ton of revenue on microtransactions. And you have to remember, League of Legends is a free-to-play game, so you don't have to pay anything to play the game, and you can get skins for free with their um, with the the rune system, I don't remember what their what their new system is, but basically you can get free crates, and you get a you have to get a key to uh, like a virtual key to open them, which is all obtainable for free. You don't have to pay anything to 
get free skins in League. But the the way it works is a little bit more complicated. You do have to play a lot of the game in order to get to get those free skins. But the game is already free to play, so the amount of time and effort that you have to spend on getting those cosmetics, I think, is justifiable. Just like in Hearthstone, for example. Let's take Hearthstone as another free-to-play game, uh, which is a different genre. It's a, it's a collectible card game, but it's a free-to-play game. So, with that in mind, you already have free cards to play with. So getting a better startup deck by buying card packs is a more is is a reasonable developer des design choice for consumers, right? So Hearthstone is free to play. You don't have to pay anything to play the game. But if you want to get better cards, if you want to win more games by having a slightly better deck than your average free to play gamer, then you can choose to buy card packs, which are Again, relatively cheap in, in Hearthstone. So having, uh, having like cards, buying cards that do affect gameplay in a free-to-play game, I think is very reasonable um, versus in a game like Rocket League or CSGO, which you have to buy initially, right? You have to pay like a 20 or 30 $40 price tag to get the game in the first place before you can proceed with the gameplay, I think. You have to really consider uh, the amount of money consumers have, right? Because nowadays, uh, games are games are a lot more expensive than they than they used to be a couple of years ago. If you think about it, salaries for the average worker aren't rising all that well. They're not rising proportionally. Uh, with the price of video games. And on top of that, video games are now adding microtransactions. Uh, they're adding DLC content. Pre-orders, right? That You have a lot more systems that developers are implementing for their products to make even more revenue. But conversely, like on the other side, consumers aren't getting paid more in society. So you have to remember that not everyone has that much money to spend on video games, and it's also not a fair system. It, it only affects naive consumers, and it really is disappointing to see that in the games industry. There are bad companies, just like there are great developing companies, and at the end of the day, you have to have, if you want to make sales, you have to have a great marketing team, and Blizzard Entertainment is probably one of the best companies that does it, that does market the, their game well and that that knows its consumers well they're they're willing to make changes when necessary and the, whenever they do have microtransactions or extra goodies to sell then they know they they real they they understand how much money a consumer is willing to spend ea on the other hand they don't seem to care about the the well-being of consumers they only care about taking money from them and being done with it doesn't matter and that's why a lot of people are railing on star wars battlefront 2 um there was a reddit comment made by an official developer from ea about star wars battlefront 2 that was uh the most downvoted comment in reddit history so the original thread which I'm not able to open right now. Hold on. I'm opening the thread. Uh, and it is a developer. Oh, so so a user on Reddit uh, wrote, Seriously, I paid $80 to have Vader locked. And uh, the thread has about 2,935 comments to this day. Uh, the top comment, which has been posted by EA's community team, uh, mentions the following. The intent is to provide players with a sense of pride and, and accomplishment for unlocking different heroes. As far as for cost, we selected initial, initial values based upon data from the open beta and other adjustments made to milestone rewards before launch. Among other things, we're looking at average per player credit earn rates on a daily basis 
and we'll be making constant adjustments to ensure that players have challenges that are compelling, rewarding, and of course, attainable via gameplay. We appreciate the candid feedback and the passion the community has put forth around the current topics here on Reddit. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Our teams will continue to make changes and monitor community feedback and update everyone as soon as we often can. Yeah, and uh, you can guess, so so that comment alone made by EA Community's team currently has minus 678,000 downvoted points, and this was posted three days ago, so you can tell that fans of Star Wars and the majority of video gamers did not handle that lightly. They... We can all see through EA's hypocrisy and bullshit. And, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they made some changes. In fact, EA did make a recent change to Star Wars Battlefront 2 about a day ago where they actually reduced the amount of, um, they reduced the cost on star cards, I believe, or, loot, or star card loot crates by one-fourth. But on top of that, they reduced the amount of in-game credits earned within the game. So, they made it seem like they made a change, but at the end of the day, it's an, ins it's an insignificant change, and it's disgusting. It, it's just, it's, it's absurd how EA runs their uh, business marketing side and um i think uh they des they deserved it i mean this all of this flack and anger in, in on the internet was well deserved and and they should not be surprised if people did not handle that well i think they take this as a lesson and ea is known for being uh, um what's the word unprincipled when it comes to uh, knowing their consumers and and they they aren't necessarily the most reputable company while they do have an incredible amount of money to produce games while they're 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 one of the biggest publishers behind games like the Sims the Sim series they the or EA sports games right they have a shitload of money to develop to develop games but they don't know they don't understand their consumer well and that's why a lot of people for years and years now have been shitting all over this publisher they're not known for being um i mean they're they're one of the biggest names in the games industry but they don't quite understand their their i mean they do understand their demography but they don't they aren't decent when it comes to selling games right and and coming up with valuable in-game content so i think i think we're good on uh, on the star wars battlefront 2 topic but it's just it's very disappointing to see something like this and uh they got what they deserved that's that's all there is to it um but let's let's move on let's move on with a different topic now i think we've railed enough about this topic let's uh quickly mention the voice actor strike which is now finally it's been finally over for about two weeks now, uh, there was a dispute between the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television, and radio artists uh, with some of the wor world's biggest video game publishers. And it's been officially over uh, as of the as of the 7th of November, uh, and, and it finally ended. It's been a year since the beginning of the voice actor strike. Um, the union first went on strike on October 20th in 2016 with a lot of members of the union refusing to work with some of the major companies, including EA, which we just talked about, Insomniac Games, Disney, and some other names. Uh, the stoppage was over two issues, so uh, the voice actors wanted royalties and residuals uh, like you know regular actors enjoy in Hollywood. And they also, on top of that, wanted better protection against uh, some of the dangers involving voice acting. So a lot of voice actors who work on the biggest games, um, they voice act for very long sessions and some smaller voice actors as well. Not just big voice actors, but the lesser known ones also are known to uh, damage their voice doing repetitive and 
hardcore tasks like screaming and crying for days upon no end, making screeching noises or, or crying or dying noises, right? Imagine if if you didn't have any like medical coverage for that kind of stuff. It would really suck. And on top of that, you're feeling underpaid. So you can imagine the amount of frustration that those those voice actors felt. Now, with the voice uh, the voice acting strike over, the new contract for voice voice acting doesn't actually meet all of the demands for from the union, but. About 90% of those voting in September decided that uh, the contract met enough of their needs. So the, the union's board approved the new deal about last month ago, and now the contract is ratified, ratified, and then, um, yeah, man, this was, this was needed. And I, I understand that uh, voice actors need to be, need to be um, respected a little bit better in, the, in that regard. I mean... Why should voice actors be paid less? If you think about it, voice actors put a lot more emotion and um, they do damage their vocal cords if they do spend an incredible amount of time recording their voices, right? It, it takes a certain amount of determination to be coming up with the best screaming or crying noise on on microphone, right? I understand that regular actors might take, you know, my, are also under danger when they're filming movies, but they are covered. They do, they are paid way more than voice actors. And it, like the proportion is so disproportionate. Like the, 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 sorry, I don't think I formulated my thought well enough. But what I'm saying is Hollywood actors that are filming with directors and for movies, they get paid millions. And then you have voice actors in video games or even cartoons, they don't get paid nearly as much as regular movie actors do. And yes, you could argue that regular movie actors, uh, you know, they do stunts, but they do have stunt doubles. A lot of, most of them have stunt doubles. Uh, yeah, they're, you know, like they, they do go on hardcore locations to film some of the best scenes in, in movies, but <sighs> voice actors, man, they're the ones that are struggling behind the, like, they're not even, you don't really know how much passion and effort voice actors pour into providing such an authentic emotional experience because it's, it's all behind the scenes. You don't have a camera in the face. Voice actors are not, the problem is people don't care about voice actors as they do for Hollywood person, Hollywood movie actors, because Media has a tendency of of focusing on drama and and big names and and popular trends and unfortunately voice actors are not the forefront of the entertainment industry. They while they are passionate and authentic and hardworking, unfortunately people don't talk about them as much. And uh, movie actors will always be way ahead of of voice actors in terms of salary. And, and recognition, and it's unfortunate, but that's just a reality that we, it's the reality we live in. And uh, thankfully, thankfully, we are now seeing better changes for, for voice actors. Um, yeah, man, I, I appreciate voice actors, especially when it comes to, you know, action adventure games or indie games that have a lot of emotional impact, like Hellblade's The Newest Sacrifice, man. That game was fantastic, and the voice acting and sound design was top of the top. It was AAA quality. It, it, it was... You could you could confuse Hellblade for a $60 game. Like, if you if you were to play the game and, and take into consideration all the voice act, acting and the... And the, the narration and the story, everything about Hellblade's A New Sacrifice gives you the idea that it could be a $60 priced, priced game. Um, but it's not. It's made by a very small team of people. And the person who voice acted uh, Sinua in Hellblade also did the motion capture. She, she was motion capturing the char character. She was the character, essentially. And she was also... Uh, a video editor for the company as well. So you, I mean, like, man, 
the 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 amount of money that someone is paid for their work is not necessarily it doesn't necessarily reflect the amount of work that they put in right and that's unfortunate and that's what kind of world we live in this is called capitalism and uh there are downsides to it unfortunately while there are a lot of great uh flip sides to capitalism unfortunately it it does have unfortunate parts to it anyway let me move on to something else now let's talk about the video game awards show which is uh going to be happening in early december if you guys didn't know the video game awards show is a yearly uh yearly awards show for video games and and some of the biggest games in the in, in the industry it's held once a year every winter uh and it features some grand personalities and, and developers and gaming like Hideo Kojima, um, YouTube celebrities and all that good shit. Uh, the reason I wanted to bring uh, bring up fourth video game, the video game awards show is because I was actually surprised to see PUBG nominated for game of the year when I was viewing. So I was glancing at the website for the video game awards show of 2017 and they already have all the games nominated. Right, you can actually still vote for the game you want to win a certain award. So if you guys wanted to take a look at that, you can go to the website, take a look at all the categories, and nominate your favorite game. Um, I I do not understand why PUBG is nominated for Game of the Year, and my reason for it is that it's an unfinished game. Any early access game does not deserve to have an award. Doesn't matter if it's being played by shitloads of players. I don't care if it has thousands of, of regular players. It's an unfinished game. It's got bugs. It's reported to have bugs. It's got graphical issues. Well, I haven't played... Granted, I haven't played the game myself. I'm not going to lie and say that I have... Pl I did try it out, however, at, at DreamHack Montreal recently. But I didn't... I clearly didn't play it enough to, for me to provide a an appropriate review or first impressions of the game. Regardless, it is an early access game, and I don't think early access games deserve an award. That's just how it should be. And unfortunately, because the game has so much popularity and money surrounding it, of course, it's going to be nominated for the Video Game Awards show. Just, it's, this kind of stuff is, uh... I think ridiculous but that's like I said earlier that's the world we live in capitalism as long as you make a lot of money and you're known as a name by thousands of people you will for sure get the award or, or at least be featured on an, on an awards show you will be celebrated put on a pedestal whatever it doesn't matter the amount of hard work or, or the amount of passion you've poured into the devel the development of a game you will still be featured because you're a big name. You're known, right? As long as people know you, we will feature you in many, many events and praise you like a goddamn savior. And unfortunately, PUBG is nominated for Game of the Year. Hopefully, the game won't win that award. I am really crossing my fingers and hoping that PUBG isn't winning the Game of the Year award. I would Actually, I think I would be really surprised if it did because... The other games that are listed for Game of the Year are Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I think there's Mario Odyssey on there. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, I think, is a great contender. Maybe the winner for that for that award, actually. I don't remember what the other games were, but they, there weren't a whole lot of them. But I do hope that PUBG is not the victor of that award. Now, some of the some of the games that I want to see win for the Video Game Awards show would be the smaller games, the, the indie titles like Cuphead or Sonic Mania or Hellblade's A New Sacrifice. I think smaller, smaller games that don't have as big of a budget or manpower I th and, and that have the quality of gameplay and graphics of a triple a those guys deserve the awards not the not the guys with the big names of the and the low and the, and the stacks of dollar bills no 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 no. we need people who are talented who uh, complete their game who bring a fantastic product that is reasonably priced i think those guys deserve to be uh celebrated not 
not games that aren't finished, man. What the fuck? PUBG, get out of the Video Game Awards show. Ironically, <laughs> we have Dr. Disrespect, who is uh, known for, for being a personality under the PUBG directory on Twitch. He is actually a nominated uh, personality for the Video Game Awards show, and I actually am kind of rooting for him. Not because he plays PUBG, but because he brings a lot of the Twitch community together, and I think um, I think he's one of the most interesting viral personalities of the of the internet. I don't personally watch him. I kind of understand his shtick, and I think he's he genuinely cares about his community. You know, despite putting a facade and and having playing a character, right? It's it's hard to be yourself, right? You there are times when you're if you're playing a persona you will sometimes break character and and laugh at a joke that a viewer is making or a fan right that can definitely happen but it's so hard to have people relate to you sometimes but when 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 you're playing a persona that people love then i think that can also be a great thing right if people respect you for the act that you put on um if it's if it's funny if it's entertaining if if it actually makes people's days better, I think that can mean a lot of a lot of good things for a lot of people. I and I think Twitch deserves to be recognized a little bit more. And I think the Video Game Awards show, uh, no, I think nominating Doctor Disrespect is gonna is going to be a good thing for Twitch, right? It's going to bring a lot of new popularity for the website, and we could always use that Twitch right now is not, I wouldn't say stagnating, it's definitely rising in terms of new viewers and, and returning viewers, and Twitch is now taking a more mainstream approach to its website. You have IRL now. A lot of YouTubers, uh, certainly like several YouTubers are moving on from YouTube to Twitch, like H3H3 H3 Productions. Um, I think Twitch is, is going towards a very interesting direction, and it it is a risky one, right? Twitch has always been gaming centric, gaming centric, but I think having someone like Doctor Disrespect, who is essentially a video gamer, right? He plays video games. He's not really not. He's not an IRL streamer. He plays PUBG, avidly plays PUBG, and he plays it seriously. Not only, I mean, he's just not not simply a persona, but he's he's actually a really good player of the game. Surprisingly, and, and well, not I don't I don't know I don't know if I would use the word surprisingly, but I think. The fact that he's not only a funny act, but a skilled video gamer. I think the combination, the two, the two, that combination alone is worthy of being celebrated. And I think, I think Twitch could, could really benefit from being recognized for having a huge, likable gaming personality to, like Dr. Disrespect. Um, so, you know. Ironically, the guy, the guy plays PUBG, a game that I don't play and that I don't think should deserve Game of the Year, but at the same time, you know, uh, PUBG has introduced us a, a, a man, uh, uh, a man who is uh, uh, the, the ultra alpha male well, with gunners on and, and the stash. I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know where I'm going with that, but all I want to say is I'm pretty happy about Dr. Disrespect being uh, nominated for personality of the year i i do hope he wins it and it, it'll be pretty funny to see him on stage if he does receive the award so i am actually pretty pretty excited about it uh but let's talk about something something else that was kind of exciting that happened recently it was blizzcon blizzcon 2017 which was held in california as per usual we've had uh, quite a quite a few major announcements not a whole lot i wouldn't say but we had some new stuff about Overwatch and, oh, quite a big, big announcement for, for World of Warcraft. Um, so, BlizzCon 2017 happened uh, in early November. We got two new announcements for Overwatch. Brand new hero, uh, Irish Irish female character by the name of M Moira. 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 She's a support, and uh, she is... A, Apparently, an ex Black Watch member from Ireland. Uh, she is supposedly similar to Zenyatta in terms of playstyle. So she plays as a healer and a damage 
dealer. So um, her her mechanics are very similar to Zenyatta and how and how she can deal damage and help out her team. So uh, her ultimate is pretty much like a, a laser that allows you to heal multiple enemies while uh, depleting the health bars of enemies. Um, and it, it can actually go through walls, which I think is quite the game changer. So I think it'll be particularly useful for payload maps for when like the enemy right heart is holding the line, but you have the Moira, uh, popping her ultimate to, to get that push going. Um, I haven't really seen what else Moira does, but she, I think she has like a, a mechanic where she throws a ball, a purple ball that can bounce around walls and damage enemies on its trajectory. Or conversely, you can have the, the healing ball do about the same thing, but it heals allies, right? So she's got that yin and yang power going on, kind of like the Zenyatta does. And uh, we could always use more support. So I think I think Blizzard is doing a great thing by introducing a new, a new support. We have, I think, a little bit too many damage dealers, and we could definitely use a little bit more variety in the support side. Uh, but I think we could also use some some new defense characters. So maybe in a few months we'll see a new type of character with uh, a more unique set of mechanics. Because I think Moira, Moira is definitely uh, oddly similar to Zenyatta, but she does feel slightly different. I don't know. Um, but it's great to have something like her in the fold now. So I'm actually kind of excited to try her out. I don't play. I don't often see myself playing a lot of support. I actually play Zenyatta, so to have something like to have a new character like Moira come come along, I think, is gonna pull me back into Overwatch. I've actually been playing the game recently on on stream, so that's been going on. But uh, apart from the new from the new character, we also have the new map, a brand new map that is called Blizzard World. And it is a theme park that celebrates all of Blizzard's games, whether it be Hearthstone, Diablo 3, or World of Warcraft. The, the map itself is laid out on uh, like a Stormwind City blueprint type. D like the, the, the theme park, the Blizzard World map is designed after Stormwind City, which is one of my favorite cities in WoW to visit. I mean, it's so damn fun. I mean, like, I do like Orgrimmar. Of course I like Orgrimmar, but Stormwind City, who could forget about? Stormwind City I is a, is a city I highly enjoyed in WoW because it's so well, it's so simple and very well organized and you know where you're going. Like, you don't even have to look at the map to know where you're going when you're stepping into Stormwind City. And I, and I think uh, Blizzard did a really good thing by choosing the layout of that World of Warcraft city for its new Overwatch map because it's it's pretty as a it's a pretty straightforward map. It's very uh, how do you put it? It's it's well lit. It's got a sunny sky and very open areas, and the and the buildings are very white. So it's it's you know you can easily find enemies in in that kind of environment, and it's it's it should be a fun map to play in because it's got it's it is different from. The Stormwind, Stormwind City in WoW, but it's got, like, n very cool additions to it and tidbits of, of, of fun, quirky references to other Blizzard games. Now, let's talk about World of Warcraft since we talked about Stormwind City. We got a brand new cinematic for Battle for Azeroth. A new cinematic, the official cinematic for Battle for Azeroth, the next up-and-coming expansion for the longest-running MMO in MMO history. So, we, in the cutscene, had Grown Up Anduin Wren versus Sylvanas Windrunner. So, they were both leading force, their own faction forces. And uh, Anduin Wren in the, in the cinematic was, like, not only a priest at that point, but he was also kind of a, kind of a paladin. He was boasting paladin gear. He had a really cool helmet on. Sylvanas, on the other, on the other hand, she has now upgraded her powers into uh, controlling her banshee form she can now turn into the banshee that she was she used to be when she was uh vanquished by what's his name arthas menethil the lich king she can now actually use that to her benefit and kill multiple people in the alliance i don't know it was kind of cool to see her do that that kind of stuff in the cin cinematic anduin can now mass res everyone he's got the he's got healing hack hacking powers 
conversely. So, anyway, the cinematic itself was pretty nice. Uh, but the cinematic isn't the, the thing that I most cared about. What I was really interested in, and that is the thing that actually made people go back to WoW recently, was the announcement about classic World of Warcraft servers. So, uh, after the cinematic was announced, we had like a rundown of some of the features that we're going to be getting for Battle for, for Azeroth. In fact, they did have... They had a gameplay trailer right after the, the cinematic. So they talked about um, sub races. We're now going to get sub races for numerous existing races like the Iron Dwarves or I guess like uh, variants of, of the elf races. I don't remember what they are. Uh, some new troll races. So I think that's pretty cool. I think it just adds more to character customization. And then on top of that, we're going to have like uh, PvP strongholds. And that actually reminded me of, uh, like, the one PvP area in Nagrand, in Outland, back in Burning Crusade. It kind of made me think of that, and I think that's a, I think it's going to be fun to have a little bit, a little bit of organized PvP in the open world, I guess. Uh, and then what else? What, 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 what else did we have for Battle for Azeroth? I don't remember all the specifics, but they did announce that they're going to be bringing back Vanilla WoW into... World of Warcraft, and uh, that pretty much floored everyone. A lot of people who are currently not playing the game were excited to hear that. Me, myself, I was actually pretty happy about that announcement, and it, it actually makes me want to play World of Warcraft again. I have not played the game since uh, Mists of Pandaria, which, uh, you know, it, it was all right, but it, it, I don't know. I've played the game for too long, and, and I needed a break, so... I have moved on to Final Fantasy XIV for a while, but I will I I might consider playing Classic well after they've announced after they've announced it on on BlizzCon. Now a lot of so a lot of uh, the questions that people are asking themselves when talking about Classic World of Warcraft are whether or not Classic well will have the same features that it used to have or would it, will it include some of the recent quality of life changes that we've had over the years like dungeon finder raid finder um the the new specialization trees the user interface like are we going to see is classic wow going to be uh, as authentic as the actual old version is it going to be the same as it was before exactly to 100% Probably not. And what I'm thinking is some of the recent quality of life changes will take place. Maybe not all of them, but I think some of the more rudimentary ones are gonna are going to be in there. Like I think transmogrification, I think I think that will actually be in classic WoW. I don't think there is a bad reason to have that. Um But for the most part, I think we'll see the world of, of Classic Well, I think, will be exactly the same as it was before. The character models will be will stay updated, I think. I think that's fine. I'm, I don't have any problem with that, but I think some of the quality changes are going to take place. And I, I don't think that's a huge issue. Um, it might kill a little bit of immersion, but I think it won't make much of a difference. I mean, I haven't played class I haven't played Vanilla Well. It's been so long since Vanilla Well, so. I don't think we're really going to care about that. And um, on a positive note, I've seen like a huge resurgence in World of Warcraft subscriptions since that announcement. Uh, a lot of my Twitch viewers have been telling me, oh, hey, Icy, I've been actually playing WoW. I don't tell my wife or, or my family or any any of my friends. Don't shame me, but I, I actually resubscribe to WoW. And I whenever I hear that, I'm very happy about that because I it inspires me to go back to WoW myself. And I... I do want to level a new character on there. It it brings back a lot of nostalgia, and I want to run Dead Mines again. I I want to try running Molten Core because I I actually never have tried a Nax Ram, original Nax Ramus or Molten Core back in the day. So I think I think it'd be really exciting for me to do stuff that I, that I didn't do when I did play Vanilla WoW because I, when I played Vanilla WoW, it was only a few months before Burning Crusade. Uh, release so I was late in the game for vanilla wow when I did start playing and I was only 14 at that time so you can imagine how behind I was on vanilla wow but I still played a good chunk of it not just I didn't unfortunately do the end game content but 
basically I got myself ready for Burning Crusade. So I did tidbits of vanilla I end game content, not all of it. Uh I'm really excited for for Classic WoW. I actually really really want to play it. Now, I wouldn't be I'm I'm actually I think what Blizzard is probably going to do with it is they're probably going to lock it to Battle for Azeroth. And I wouldn't be surprised if they would force people to resubscribe and to have to buy the new expansions just to play Classic WoW. That's understandable. I mean, I I don't have a huge problem with it, but I think that's likely to happen. And knowing Activision and Blizzard, uh, they're probably going to want to cash and capitalize on sales by locking Classic WoW to Bla Battle, Battle for Azeroth. Uh, I, I would not be shocked at all if that was the case. Uh, but let's move on to the final topic of the day that I wanted to to touch on, and that is Stardew Valley. One of my one of my absolute favorite indie titles, Stardew Valley. If you guys haven't played it yet, go check it out. Buy it on Steam or the Nintendo Switch or the PlayStation 4 and Xbox. It's the one of the best multi-platform indie titles that you could play. It's fantastic. It, it is uh, very reminiscent of, of uh, Harvest Moon, and it's, I would say, even better than Harvest Moon, if you would where to compare. Uh, now, the reason I wanted to talk about Stardew Valley is because not only is it my one of my favorite games of all, indies of all time, but it's going to get an update, which I've been waiting on for the longest time, and that is the multiplayer mode. Now, Concerned Ape, the... Uh, the main developer of the game, and I guess the only one, I don't know, I guess he's been working with other developers recently, but when it comes to, when it came to creating the game before it was released, Concerned Ape was the sole developer for the game, which I think is incredible. It's very inspiring to see a single developer, developer create a hit title, kind of like the Toby Fox created Undertale. Oh my God, those two dudes are, uh, pot of, like, I, like, fucking Jedis or something. I don't know what to call them. But Concerned Ape just recently tweeted on Twitter with uh, a screen cap of the game that he's testing multiplayer. It's coming along great. Uh, I'm really excited. This is already fun, and it's only going to get better before release. Check out my log cabin. So this was tweeted on the 8th of November, and recently he put up another tweet about the multiplayer mode, which he said uh, this was about... I want to say 24 hours ago, he wrote, I'm working on some new Stardew Valley content to be released with the upcoming free multiplayer update. This will affect some single player too. I'll share more when the release gets closer, though I'll keep some things secret. More fun. And uh, he includes another screen cap. This time it's uh, a screenshot of a boat, of a fishing boat that I guess you could get on. And I feel like we might go on a on an island with it, so that sounds kind of exciting, but um, I'm always uh, impressed by Concerned Ape, and the, the amount of work and passion he pours into Stardew Valley is oh, phenomenal. I mean, the game's already been out for more than a year, a year and a half now, and it's still getting content, and uh, all of the new content is going to be free to play. It's always been free. A anything that he's put out for the game, any update, is free to play, and that... Ladies and gentlemen, is the kind of development that we should promote in the games industry. So, I cannot wait to get back to Stardew Valley. I I actually bought it for my Switch. I already had it for my PC. I, I had played 75 hours of it, and now I'm building a new farm on my Nintendo Switch console. And I'm not. I don't regret it. Playing Stardew Valley from the toilet, from the toilet seat, or in the living room is probably one of the most therapeutic gaming experiences I've ever had. And I would recommend it to all of you. But anyway, with that said, ladies and gentlemen, I I hope you had a great I hope you you have a great week. I hope your your week ends very very well. Uh, I wish you all a great weekend. If you want to uh, check out our live content, uh, you can go to twitchtv volk for live gaming content. And if you want to be part of our community, be free to feel free to join us on Discord at discordgg volk. If you want to partake in video game conversations, please do not hesitate to be part of our Discord server. And you can always follow me at Twitter at twitter.com slash icvolk for announcements, ramblings, musings, all kinds of shenanigans. And if you would like to support this broad, uh, this audio blog series, mm, think about maybe 
uh, supporting us on Patreon with $1 minimum a month at patreon.com slash icyvolk. But with that said, I, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, whether it be the morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, we will see each other hopefully next week with, with another episode of Coffee and Games or Power Up, whichever title you guys prefer. We'll see, we'll see each other next week. Signing off, your Emperor and Shitlord, Icy Volk. Until next time on the number one shit show.